Well, guys, it's exciting to be here with you tonight. I, um, I've been preparing for this for quite a while, and yet you always have that little bit of nervous energy going, man, I get to talk to a lot of really bright people. What am I doing up here? And in all sincerity, I mean, I know that the, the, the congregation here is characterized as having walked with the Lord longer than I have. And many of you have walked deeper with the Lord than I have and had some incredible experiences. And yet I get to share a little bit here and hopefully encourage you. Um, so I just want to be able to get those disclaimers out there and also say thanks to everyone who set this up. Typically, I'm behind the scenes setting things up, not the one that's speaking. And so this is kind of a fun role for me. And I love tag team teaching with that guy. I love teaching with JK. And this is just an absolute honor. So excited to do this. We're going to go ahead and dive in. Look at Joshua 14 with me for a second. As you head that way, I want to set the, the scene a little bit and let you know a little bit about the angst I feel with this and, and probably you feel as well. In 1993, I was wrapping up a, a ministry school called Tent Makers. It was for, small, or for uh, student ministries, and it was just a crash course on practical ministry. And the way we wrapped up that particular class or that environment was to be in Wilderness North, they called it. Wilderness North was in the north woods of Minnesota, near Canada, a private lake, if you can believe that, and we're just basking in God's creation. It was awesome. And a bunch of 22-year-olds with eyes wide open, not real sure what we were about to do in ministry, and the founder of Tent Makers came over. His name's Dick Amundsen, one of the most encouraging guys I've ever met, one of the most visionary guys I've ever met. And he got together with us, pulled us into a huddle of about 20, 25 people, and he said, guys, I need you to know this before you go out into ministry. The average age of death in the United States is 27. The average age of burial is 77. He already had me, right? And he went on to explain. He said, here's what happens in our culture, and you know this to be true. In our culture, what happens is we hurry to get through the school. And we, we anticipate and we're excited about finding that spouse. And we find that special someone. And then we find that special place. And then we have those 2.3 kids. And we have our dog named Spot. And we settle into this career. And then we hang on for dear life. And he went on and explained this, that instead of being dead at 27, buried at 77, what if? What if you actually lived that entire time? And then he stretched my mind a little bit. I was 22 at the time. He said, now what if? Because of advancing health stuff, medicine stuff, what if you lived to 100? What if you had a plan to be intentional until 100? What would that look like? And here I am as a 22-year-old going, okay, I just graduated college. I'm taking notes. How, I got how many more years left? A lot. Okay, I got a lot of years left. Didn't take math. Okay, I got to. And it was exciting. And then he passed out this stuff. He said, we're going to work on a 100-year plan. Because the last thing we need to do is hurry up and settle into something and hang on for dear life and miss life itself. I loved it. I loved it. So he got me thinking in a different way about longevity and planning and, and saying to God, God, I'll give you not only everything today, but everything with every day. I struggle like you do, but I love the heartbeat behind that. That's one part of who I am. The other part of who I am was on vacation last week also in Minnesota, also the Northwoods, near the Canadian border, on this glorious lake. I've got, I keep going back. And I'm on this lake, and it was half a day into vacation, and you know what I was thinking about? This can, this can be really strange. I was, I was carrying two things at the same time. I was preparing a message on Caleb for you, and at the same time, this finishing well concept, at the same time I'm going, I could have a place like this one day. I could retire, I could retire sooner. If I work harder and save more, I can retire. And I'm having this crazy battle in my head, and, and maybe you guys have been there, maybe you're, maybe you're there now. I was having this battle going, okay, if we had a place, what would it look like? Well, it'd have to be comfortable and kind of cozy and kind of modest, but it has to be big enough for the kids to come back and then for the grandkids to hang out, and then it's got to be on a lake because the lakes are awesome. And, and we're going to have a lake, but the lake's got to be just private enough to where it's kind of quiet when I want it to be quiet, but big enough that you can have a jet ski or a tube, and, 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 and i got to be able to fish. The fishing's got to be good. It's got to be a deep lake. It's got to be a clear lake. And we've got to be really secluded because that's awesome, but the grocery store has to be right there. <laughs> you guys know how this works. And I ha seriously, I, I checked out for about three hours on a deck, and I was like, oh, yeah, Caleb, finishing well. Right? <laughs> I'll bet you guys battle some of these things too. What's next? How do I finally get to relax? How do I get to kind of cash in on the hard work and coast a little? And I'm not so sure that's quite what we're supposed to do. In my best spirit-led moments, I'm saying, God, 
all yours, all the time, with every breath. And it doesn't take long to let off the accelerator to go, but God, if I could have this and coast for just a little while, it'd be awesome. You guys ever struggle with that? My guess is you do. You come here to, to hear this Finishing Well series and you, you want to say, I, I'm in. I don't exactly know what it looks like. I didn't come here to get beat up tonight, but I kind of want to stay sharp. And that's what we're doing here. We're going to look at the life of Caleb. And the reality is he had the same clashing expectations and cultural battles that we have. There's a lot of things that talk to us and say, you know, here's what you deserve. The old commercial used to be, you deserve a break today. The commercials now are saying, here's where you deserve to play golf, and here's where you deserve to coast, and here's what you get to relax in, and here's how this works. Maybe, maybe, but we want to be able to provoke one another a little bit here. This is a room full of faithful people, I know that. But to provoke one another and say, what is, what is the standard? What does the Bible say about this? What do some of the heroes of the faith do with that tension between relax and coast and God's got more? And Caleb is an awesome example of this. There's this clash of expectations. I've already been describing this to you. And if you looked at Hebrews 11, a lot of you know Hebrews 11 is that hall of fame, hall of faith kind of thing. It's all kinds of people that are being described as incredibly faithful. By faith this, by faith that, by faith he, by faith she, over and over and over again. And have you noticed the people on that list? A lot of them peaked when they were much older. They didn't peak in their 30s or 40s or even 50s or 60s, you look at people like Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Samuel. You can check that out in Hebrews 11, but you can also check it out in this room. People who are more faithful today than they were 10 years ago, 20 years ago, stepping up and serving today in ways that they didn't in their 20s and 30s when they had more energy, right? So we look at this and then we think, okay, now what's Caleb dealing with? And what I want to do with Caleb is, is kind of go backwards with this. I want to start with the end and then figure out how he got there. Most of us know the story of Caleb. We know kind of his, his peak moments when he had this amazing declaration. We're going to start there. And then I want to look back and say, well, how did God get him there? So look with me at Joshua 14, verses 6 through 15. It's really a culmination of Caleb's faithfulness. If you're taking notes, this is also in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 19 through 40, the same story, a parallel, and also in Numbers 13 and 14 in much more detail. But this is Caleb. This is a culmination. This is the peak of his, his, his faithful statements and faithful actions. It's a familiar theme in Scripture. In fact, you see this in a variety of ways. In Scripture, you see a lot of this. God has this incredible plan for his children. The reaction is the children say, we have a, an incredible plan for us that may or may not include you. And then God makes a series of promises and shows incredible steadfast love, and then the children of God aren't quite so steadfast and don't follow through with their promises. And this goes back and forth. And eventually God says, I will fulfill my promises, and, and if necessary, through a remnant, through a few or through one who's with me, and then he'll carry out his plan. And Caleb was one of those that said, I'm in. I'd like to be a part of this. So here's the play-by-play. -play. Joshua 14, verses 7 and 8 says this. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought him word again as it was in my heart. But my brothers who went up with me made the heart of the people melt. Yet I wholly followed the Lord my God. Okay, we start there. Caleb is in this great situation where he is one of 12 spies sent out to check out this land. God's promises, you're going to inherit this. And the people said, well, let's take 12 and go check this out for 40 days. Caleb was one of them. And so he goes there, and uh, he's challenging the people to have faith while there's a bad report going on. Verse 9 says this, And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land on which your foot has trodden shall be an inheritance for you and for your children forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. Caleb had remembered the promises that were told to him 45 years earlier. I'm not sure I'll remember anything for 45 years. If I lived long enough, maybe some of those 80s songs. I'm not sure. But 45 years is a long time to remember a specific promise, and he remembered this. And here's where it starts to get good. You guys know this story. Joshua 14, 10 through 11. And now behold, 
The Lord has kept me alive just as he said these 45 years since the time that the Lord spoke this word to Moses while Israel walked in the wilderness. And now, behold, I am this day 85 years old. I am still as strong today as I was in the day of Moses sent me. My strength now is as my strength was then for war, for going, and for coming. And those of us who are getting creaky joints are saying, Amen. I love that to be me. 85, he's going, remember back in the 40s? My 40s? Yeah, I'm like that now. I'm still strong. I'm still ready to go. Pretty cool declaration. God's doing some sustaining work in him, but here's where it really gets good. Verses 11 and 12. So now give me this hill country. In some versions it says, give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke on that day. For you heard on that day how the Anakim were there with great fortified cities. It may be, I wonder if he paused, it may be that the Lord will be with me and shall drive them out just as the Lord said. Do you hear what's going on here? I don't know if you know how the the commentaries wrestle with this, how the theologians wrestle with this, but what's happening is, here's your inheritance. We're dividing this up among the 12 tribes. And you guys, Judah, Caleb, uh, okay, here we go. He's like, give me the mountain. I want to be there. I was there 45 years ago. No one was with me. I want to take it now. I'm going to take it for my crew, my clan, my tribe. And he says, regardless of who's up there, I'm in. Some people say, well, what was really happening is the battle was already over and all he had to do was walk in. Some theologians say that. Some say there was a massive battle yet to come. And some people are in the middle saying, I think what was happening is the battle was mostly over, but there were still some people straggling along. There was going to be a mild skirmish. What Caleb is saying is, I don't know what the battle is that's coming, but I'm in. No matter how high the climb is to get there, no matter who's waiting for me on their side, let's go. God had a promise. It's time to to cash in on this. Very exciting stuff. Verses 13 and 14 says that Joshua blessed him and gave Hebron to Caleb for the inheritance, and why? Because he wholly followed the Lord, the God of Israel. Okay, that's the victory. Give me this mountain. I'm 85. I'm as strong as I was back then. I'm still swinging for the fence. I'm still going. I'm still fighting. I'm in. I'm not intimidated. I'm not scared. I'm claiming God's promises. Let's go. Great battle cry. Great stuff. And we usually remember that part, but don't remember what happened before that. So look back with me at the culmination, not just the culmination of his faithfulness, but how he was going to have his character cultivated. How he was going to have his character cultivated. Part of it's waiting on the Lord. Part of it's having patience. 45 years? In your groups later today, you may want to have that conversation. How long have you waited for something that really, really, really mattered to you? Can you think of an example where you waited more than a year? More than a decade? Now think about the current generation that gets jittery because it's been three seconds to do a worldwide Google search and they're going, come on! My situation, it takes one minute to brew coffee on my Keurig and I'm like, let's go! We're in this instant society, but God isn't necessarily that way, right? We know that. We know that. How long do you wait on God? Seriously. How long do we wait and really trust him do we know what it is to faithfully wait on him in the difficult times as well not just for the coffee when we and some of us in this room when we hear the word cancer do we wait on god and say okay okay i'm still your child and you're still sovereign do we wait for decades when our adult children are still rejecting god and say okay I will be faithful and I will entrust my son or daughter to you to return to you. Do we wait when there's corporate downsizing and we're not sure where we fit? Do we wait in those situations where it's genuinely out of our control and we're going, okay, now is the time. And I wonder how long Caleb was going, okay, I have to to rehearse. God is faithful. God is good. God is in control. He did make that promise. It's been 20 years. Okay, he did make that promise. It's been 30 years. People are dying off. Okay, it's been 40 years. But here's our God, and Caleb is trusting in his character. So in your notes here, it says, a cultivation of Caleb's character. How did this happen? Caleb conquered himself before conquering Canaan. 
What I mean is he was able to figure out how to lead himself and conquer the things that would distract him before he tried to conquer something bigger. He conquered himself before conquering Canaan. And Caleb wholly followed the Lord my God. This is something that I hope you already heard as we were reading through the text, but it's everywhere. Six times in the scripture, there was this wholly followed the Lord kind of phraseology. First one is Deuteronomy 1.36. God said of Caleb's inheritance, He shall see it, and to him and to his children I will give the land on which he has trodden, because he has wholly followed the Lord. That's Deuteronomy. Numbers 14.24, God said, But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit and has followed me fully, I'll bring, into the land, I'll bring him into the land in which he went, and his descendants shall possess it. Numbers 32.12, listen to this one. God said, Surely none of the men who came up out of Egypt from 20 years old and upward shall see the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob, because they have not wholly followed me. None except Caleb and Joshua, for they have wholly followed the Lord. You see the trend. This goes on in Joshua 14.8. This goes on in Joshua 14.9 and 14.14. 14. Holy following the Lord, holy following the Lord, holy following the Lord. Great statement to be made about somebody. And it was said by Moses, it was said by Caleb, and it was said by God over and over again, this is the kind of person who wholly follows the Lord. It kind of clashes with some of our cultural expectations, though. We always want to coast. We always want to have that break today. We were faithful enough for long enough. That's not how it worked for Caleb. What did holy, the, holy following the Lord look like for Caleb? Where's the evidence? You know, one of the things that's awesome is he was faithful in little before he was faithful in much. I don't know if you picked up on that or not, but he was faithful in little first. Faithful in little because when you look at this, he was chosen. When they decided, when the people decided, we have to send 12. We have to send 12 to go see for about 40 days up in, up in that region over there. See if we can take that over. God said something about it. Let's go check it out. And they went to the different tribes, and they went to the leaders of those tribes. They went to Caleb, leader or chief of Judah, because he'd already proven himself in a smaller way. They said, okay, you're already influential. You're already kind of running this thing in this area. Um, we need you to have an important task here. You were faithful in little. Will you be faithful in much? Also sounds a little bit like Jesus, doesn't it? If you're faithful in little, will you be faithful in much? Stewardship. So a fair question for you and for me is to say, think about the things that have been entrusted to you already. To me. Are we being faithful with those little things? Are we? If so, then maybe he's saying, okay, here's what's next. Let me entrust you with more because you're showing yourself faithful here. And in this case, Caleb was faithful in, in some of the little things, and now he's on the scene in a big, big way. The other thing that's interesting is Caleb was willing to go on a mission. This is a 40-day trip to a hostile enemy territory through rough terrain. Some of you that aren't 40 yet, think about what it was like when you were 40 and what your calendar looked like and how busy you were, how much you were chasing after the kids and everything else and hustling. Some of you who aren't there yet, you'll get there, but it's a crazy, crazy time. And hey, Caleb, here's the deal. We'd like you to just kind of check out for about 40 days. I know you're busy. You've got your schedule, but would you come over here for 40 days and get some work done? And when he was asked, when the call was brought forth, he's like, I'm in. Send me. And if you're like me, sometimes my schedule is so full that I'm saying, I'd love to be in, but I, I've got my agenda and it's booked. Sorry. How about next week? Next month? Next year? Next decade? Eventually? Someday? Maybe? But Caleb's like, I'm in. I can do that. He was also willing not only to go in there for 40 days, but he was willing to have a faith-filled response when everybody around him was saying, no, this isn't going to work. Now imagine this for a second. You're 40 days with 12 people, 12 spies, and there's at least two very, very strong opinions that are very much opposed. I don't know how this exactly worked, but I love to, to dream about it. When they're in there and they're checking things out, I'm convinced that on their way up the mountain, one's going, two are going, hey, God promised. It's going to work. I don't care how big they are. God promised. We're done. We got this. And the others are going, we'll never make it. <laughs> There's not a chance. And for 40 days, they're seeing things through different lenses, and they're talking amongst themselves. They're saying, we have to bring back a report. Yeah, we'll speak first. 
we'll share what's going to happen. We'll tell you what the report is. You know what I mean? And so they get back, and you see the report, and, and it says that the people gave this bad report that made the people melt. The spies gave this report and said, look, they're huge. We're like grasshoppers to them. Yeah, the fruit's good, but they're huge. We can't do this. And you remember Joshua's response in the midst of faithlessness. Joshua and Caleb both. Caleb speaks out and says, look, guys, we have to have a faith-filled response here. God promised. He's in charge. I wonder, let's, let's bring that home for just a second. In our culture today, isn't there a faithless response to most of the things we see? Isn't there a contrary to Scripture response to most things that we see? We could be like the ten spies that are saying, hey, let your heart melt, it's going to be ugly. There's no chance, there's no way to win. Or we step up, like Caleb, like Joshua, and say, God's got a plan, and he's a lot bigger. And I wonder what that looks like for us. I really do. I don't, I don't mean the obnoxious, standing on a street, street corner screaming, but how do we speak into our culture today? Because you're not done. As empty nesters, as retired folks, we're not done. How do we speak into that? How do we use the influence we already have? In this case, Caleb made the most of it. Even though there was a tide of public opinion fading over here, he's standing here saying, remember God? Remember those promises? John Maxwell says this, I love what he says about Caleb. Caleb teaches us that leadership has less to do with age than it does with attitude. It's not a matter of position, but of disposition. Growing older doesn't have to mean growing ineffective. And Caleb would say, amen. 85, I'll take that mountain. Hmm. By the way, we, I, I think we misunderstand comfort, and then I'll get off this little soapbox. In, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 7, make a note of this for later. The word comfort or comforter or comforted is all over this section. It's all over the place. We misunderstand comfort sometimes because we think that God of all comfort means, hey, get the lazy boy. Relax, remote in hand, cold drink over here, life's good. But God of all comfort isn't about comfort as in removing you from challenge and struggle. It's about saying, in the midst of it, I will be your comforter. And in the midst of your strife and your struggle, you will find ways to comfort others, right? I, I share that because, again, the, the very noisy culture that we live in says, comfort, comfort, relax, you deserve a break today, ghost. You're no longer relevant, step to the side. Finish well means finish quietly over here somewhere. But that's not how it goes. That's not how our faith is. That's not how our God is. Pretty exciting stuff. Leonard Sweet says this, it's in your notes, I love this phrase in the book Aqua Church. We are making choices to become risk-free, fail-safe ships that spend entire tours of duty hugging harbors. Our ancestors' zeal for God has given way to another kind of zeal, a zeal to seek immunity from life's prosecutions. We're more concerned about the question, what are our securities, than the question, what are our ministries? Our pews are occupied by people who want to be moved, but who don't want to move. I know I'm preaching to the choir. You guys are here because you're already fired up and want to keep growing and stretching with every breath, with every day. But we need more Calebs. We just do. We need more Calebs that are going to say, I'm not done yet. There's things to do. I'm going to be faithful in little, and I'm going to grow to faithful in much. There's an example. I, there's all kinds of biblical examples, but there's one that I'd like to highlight that, that's really from Eastview. One from Eastview. Bill Herder. I don't know if you guys know Bill. Bill passed away about three, maybe four years ago now. Bill, in his 70s, started attending a biblical leadership study because he wanted to start growing <laughs> in what it meant to be a, a, a leader that pursued God. How cool is that? And with, with a, a youthful attention and an exuberance, he'd be like, hey guys, we gotta get in this thing. We've got to find ways to improve in this. Time is short. Let's go. And almost every time we got together weekly here in the, in the atrium, he was tearing up saying, guys, this is, this is where we need to be. There's a, there's a world that needs Christ. He was so passionate. He was a lead cheerleader for us. Once a week, he would be in our prayer chapel with a couple other guys praying over the cards that are up there and just saying, guys, 
there's a hurting world, they need Jesus, let's go. He was awesome. If I understand the detail right, on his last day, he was shoveling the driveway for his wife. And that's how he died. On his last day, he dropped off a present for someone that he'd be ministering to from the prison ministry. His last day was absolutely consumed, figuring out how can I serve everybody else. He finished really, really well. The most amazing thing to me about Bill is that about a week and a half, two weeks after his funeral, his widow, his wife called, and Carol was asking questions. I've talked to Carol and asked for permission to share this, but she was saying, can you come over to the house? Bring a couple staff over, and we came over, and she laid out some stuff, and she said, I don't, I don't know what to do. This file cabinet is full of names and ministries that are very active. This is what Bill did in his retirement years. And here's a cell phone, and it keeps ringing with all kinds of people that are still trying to get wisdom from him and be mentored by him. I can't handle it all. Can the church start to take over? Man, was it sobering. Somebody who finished really really well inspires me it's maybe easier to say at 45 i'm gonna i'm gonna finish well and 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 live that way to my final breath and maybe reality will hit me in another decade or two but that's my inspiration seeing examples life on life like that you see in your notes here the big idea the big idea make sure we don't miss this and then we'll close the big idea finishing well requires faith in a big god with big plans that makes our mountains and giants look small. How big is your God? How big are his plans for you? Because we've got a big community that desperately needs to see a big, big God.